The man was shot. His eyes were wide open, his mouth hung open, and finally he spoke. You're a Christian? He was completely dumbfounded. Seriously, you're a Christian? I've worked with you for five years. There's no way you are a Christian. Yes, the other man responded, I am. Now I'm going to stop the story right here. Already in your heads, you've set up where you think this story is going to go. The story is barely even started, but already we have some preconceived ideas as to why one might be shocked that the other person is a Christian or a believer. Is there someone in your life who you think there is no way they are a believer, and why do you think that they're not? The likeliest answer is that they don't act like one. They cuss up a storm, they steal from their employer on the job, they tell the dirtiest of dirty jokes, they're down at the strip club on Saturday night, they gossip, they lie, they cheat, they use God's name in vain. I could go on and on and on. The assumption is the man in this story doesn't believe the other is a Christian because of the bad acts this guy commits. That would be my assumption. He's a bad person, and that's why the other man is so shocked. There's no way this guy's a Christian because of the way he acts. So, let me continue the story. You're kidding me, right? You really are a Christian. Yes, his co-worker said. How many times do I have to say it? Well, the other man rubbed his chin as he spoke. Well, last year, we had a man working here who talked to me about being a Christian. He asked me if I wanted to believe in Jesus Christ. I listened, but I told him I wasn't interested. He said, well, you know, why, why aren't you interested? He goes, I pointed to you. And I said, you know that man standing over there? I've worked with him for five years. I've never heard him swear, not even once. He loves his wife and his family. I've never heard him tell a dirty story. I've, I've never even heard him talk badly about the boss like we all do behind the scenes. That man is one of the cleanest, upstanding, and honest men I have ever met in my entire life. And if he can live that way without religion, so can I. Do you know what the problem was? The guy had never talked about his faith. He had never said a word. He lived a moral and upright, upright life, just like God had called him to do. But he missed on one little point. He had never explained why he lived the way he lived. It was obvious that he loved his family. It was obvious that he was a, a good man. But he didn't say one thing about the reason why. In Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. That man lived by faith, but apparently he seemed a little ashamed to talk about it. My guess is that, is that if you asked him, he would tell you, my life is a witness for God. Others should just be able to tell that I believe just by looking at my life. Why do I need to say it? Well, first of all, I understand that it's a scary thing to talk about your faith. We live in a world that has a very low view of believers and Christians in general. Tom Rainer is the CEO of Lifeway Christian Bookstores and he quoted a comment to one of his blog posts online. The reason the world hates Christians is because they behave badly, they're rude, they're boorish, arrogant, conceited, full of themselves, ignorant, and judgmental. So what do we do in response? We become skeuomorphs. Now before you take offense at that term or think that I'm calling you an alien, here are some examples of skeuomorphs. A skeuomorph is a design meant to resemble another design, even when that design isn't needed anymore. For example, the wonderful wood grain on a station wagon. Why is there wood grain on a station wagon? What is the reason that they would put that on a station wagon? What use is there? There is no use whatsoever. But there is a reason for it, and it is a skeuomorph. It's because many years ago, when they first started building station wagons, guess what they were made out of? Wood. The sides of them were wood. They were all wood. Therefore, when they became built out of steel, 
they went ahead and put these appliques of wood on the side to evoke the emotion and the tradition of the original station wagon. And guess what? These existed right up until the 80s. And, and when was it? It was in the 40s and 50s that station wagons were originally invented. And it stayed. And in fact, you may have seen back a few years ago when PT Cruisers were real popular, PT Cruisers, even in the last few years, you can still see some on the road that have wood grain siding. It is a skewmorph. There is no need for it. There is no reason to have wood grain siding on a station wagon. There is no reason to have wood grain siding on a PT Cruiser except tradition, emotion. The same things that we attach ourselves to, they want to keep those there. What about the recycle bin? Do we really need a trash can on our computer screen? to tell us that that's where you delete your files. Really, seriously. Do we need it on a computer? Is there any reason for it to be there? Of course not. An LED light used for a candle? What about a microphone that shows up on your screen when you are recording? Again, a skewmorph. This is used, uh, if you go to iBooks, it's also in the Kindle they use it, to put your library. They don't need to make it look like a bookshelf. It could just be a list of books. But instead, they make it by something that reminds us of something that we've used before. Tradition, it uses the same thing. And here is my favorite one of all, because I've seen this a lot. The AM radio. Back in the old days, my old days, it used to be that to use a radio, you twisted the dial and you watched a little thing physically, manually move across. And what they've done with this, they've made it look just like that. So when you turn the dial, you watch it move across. Is that necessary anymore? Not at all. That is a skewomorph. It is entirely unnecessary. So how do we act like skewomorphs? It is when we decide that the only way to fit in is to look like the world, act like the world, and talk like the world, and yet still try to hold on to our faith. We want to fit in with the world, so we shapeshift into something acceptable to the world. Jesus actually faced this in his life. The religious leaders of his day expected Jesus to ride in triumphantly on a white horse and he was going to take over the world, he was going to knock down the Roman Empire. All of this he was going to do to bring to the Jewish people what they wanted. They wanted Jesus to be a skewomorph. They wanted him to resemble what they knew and the tradition that they loved and that they held to. So when Jesus didn't follow that, they immediately turned their back on him. Churches do this too. Author Steve McSwain puts it this way. It's been the trend the last couple of decades for traditional mainline churches to pretend to be something that they're not. Many of them have experimented with praise bands, the installation of screens, praise music. Now let me be clear, that's not an indictment of megachurches at all. Most megachurches began living outside of the traditional role of churches when they started in the first place. I'll give you an example. Cedar Creek started at the Perrysburg Junior High School in the gym. It was never in a traditional place. It didn't begin there. So I'm not saying that just because churches choose to go that direction that that's wrong. But traditional churches that try to be something that they're not are trying are basically becoming skewmorphs. They're trying to do something that doesn't fit in with what they were supposed to be in the first place. One of the advantages of what we do here is we don't have any tradition to fall back on. <laughs> Look at where you're sitting. Look at what we're doing. This is completely different. So if I decide next Sunday that we're going to do the the whole service backwards, which I do every once in a while, it doesn't matter. We, we, we don't have any tradition to fall back on. It's not something totally out of line with what we do. We are not stuck in the skew morph. We can do whatever we desire here as long as it is praiseworthy and it is in the will of God. Many of our traditional churches, though, have become skew morphs. Instead of being true to their identity, they've adopted the style of something that they're not. As individuals, we do the same thing. It's when we try to mold ourselves into something that is acceptable by the world when the Bible never said we were to be acceptable by the world. Romans 12, 2. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. That verse to me is saying, don't be a skewmorph. I think 
Eugene Peterson, who wrote the paraphrase, The Message, was clearly troubled by this verse because he doesn't just tell you the verse. He gives a short sermon. So let's hear from Eugene Peterson. He says, don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. You've just seen a description of how to break out of being a skeuomorph. Don't do what the culture says. Don't do what everybody else says. You be what God wants you to be. You be what God wants you to be in every way, whether it be in church or out of church. The amazing thing about the man in the story at the beginning of my message is that he wasn't a skeuomorph at all. He actually stood out. He was different. He was noticed for being different. He didn't act the way the others acted. He didn't do the things the others did. His coworker noticed him and wanted to be like him. However, he assumed that he didn't have any religion at all. He wasn't a skeuomorph, but he forgot one important element of our faith. It is an element that we get hung up on because it has become an urban myth that no one wants to hear about religion. That's what's hammered into our heads over and over again. And guess what? It's not true. A study of almost 1,500 adults was conducted of those specifically who were unchurched. And the definition they used of unchurched were people who had not attended in the previous six months any religious service whatsoever. Here's the result. 78% said they'd be willing to listen to someone who wanted to share what they believe about Christianity. 78%. That means more of your friends, more of your co-workers, more of your schoolmates, more of the people around you want to know than don't. 1 Peter 3, 15 and 16, But in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. I think right there is the problem with our guy from the beginning of the story. He never gave a reason. He never provided an explanation for why he lived the way he lived. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience, so those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. Sharing our faith can be scary, but I believe we are more afraid of it than I think we should be. We don't share because we think people don't want to hear. The word proselytize has become a bad word. The definition of proselytize is to convert or attempt to convert someone from one religion, belief, or opinion to another. Proselytize. We don't want to be accused of it, and yet the world wants us to be accused of it because they want to hear from us. If you don't believe me, maybe an atheist will convince you. Penn Gillette. He is a comedian, an actor, and an illusionist, and puts on a really great show. He is also an unequivocal atheist, and he will tell you straight out that he's an atheist. He's a diehard atheist. Now, you would assume, based on who he is, and the fact that he is an atheist, that he would hate to be witness to. But remember that verse in uh, 2 Peter where it says at the end, but do this with gentleness and respect. Notice those words, gentleness and respect. Reaching out to people around you with gentleness and respect. That's very important when it comes to Pendulette's view of Christians and what they should be doing. I want to talk to you about this. Uh, I get home from the show, and at the end of the show, as I've mentioned before, we go out and we, uh, we talk to folks and you know, sign an occasional autograph and shake hands and so on. And there was one guy waiting over to the side in the um, what I call the hover position. And he walked over to me and he said, um, I was here last night at the show. And uh, uh, I saw the show and I liked it. I wanted, and he was very complimentary about my use of language and um, complimentary about, you know, honesty and stuff. He said nice stuff. No reason to go into it. He said nice stuff. And then he said, I brought this for you. And he handed me a uh, Gideon pocket edition. Um, I thought it said from the New Testament, but I also thought it was Psalms from the New Testament, right? Or 
uh, Psalms from the New, just part of the New Testament. Little book about this big, this thick, you know. He said, I wrote in the front of it, and I wanted you to have this. I'm kind of uh, proselytizing. I and mean, then he said, I'm a businessman. I'm, I'm sane. I'm not crazy. And he looked me right in the eye and did all of this. And uh, it was really wonderful. I believe he knew that I was an atheist. But he was not uh, defensive. And he looked me right in the eyes. And he was truly complimentary. It wasn't in any way... It didn't seem like empty flattery. He was really kind and nice and sane and looked me in the eyes and talked to me and then gave me this Bible. And I've always said, you know, that I, I don't respect people who don't proselytize. I don't respect that at all. If you believe that there's a heaven and hell and people could be going to hell or not getting eternal life or whatever, and you think that, uh, well, it's not really worth telling them this because it would make it socially awkward. And atheists who think that people shouldn't proselytize, just leave me alone, keep your religion to yourself. Uh, how much do you have to hate somebody to not proselytize? How much do you have to hate somebody to believe that everlasting life is possible and not tell them that? I mean, if I believed beyond a shadow of a doubt that a truck was coming at you and you didn't believe it, that truck was bearing down on you, there's a certain point where I tackle you, and this is more important than that. And I've always thought that, and I've written about that, and I've thought of it conceptually. But this guy was a really good guy. He was polite and honest and sane, and he cared enough about me to proselytize and give me a, a Bible. But I'll tell you, he was a very, very, very good man. And... Uh, that's really important. And with that kind of goodness, uh, it's okay to have that deep of a disagreement. I still think that religion does a lot of bad stuff, but man, that was a good man who gave me that book. That's all I wanted to say. That's probably one of the most powerful witnesses, and it came from an atheist. But notice, gentleness and respect. Gentleness and respect. Notice that the man who handed the Gideon Bible to Penn Jillette didn't yell at him, didn't tell him he was going to hell. He didn't berate him or attack him for his atheistic views. He didn't become a skewmorph and then try to adapt and be what Penn Jillette expected him to be. Instead, he showed in his behavior and attitude what it means to be a believer, and he said something. He said something. Jesus tells us not only to live the life he has called us to, but to tell others about it. Matthew 28, 19 and 20, the famous Great Commission. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. Jesus has called us to reach out to the world. Jesus doesn't expect us to shapeshift and become something that will be acceptable to the world. Instead, we are to be what God has called us to be, and it's personal, but it's also corporate. Don't let your neighbor wonder why you never mention your faith. Don't let your neighbor wonder why you never invited them to church.